the brilliance of many of these idea pathogens is that it can penetrate all of your education and knowledge. Now, of course, science is provisional and that what we thought was true 300 years ago might get updated. Science is autocorrective, so it's not a revealed truth and we're done, mic drop, but it is that we do think that there are things to be discovered. So postmodernism is, is the granddaddy of idea pathogens for that reason. One instantiation of six degrees of folk causality is six degrees of Noam Chomsky. So I give you a malady around the world and you have to link it to the US military industrial complex in six or fewer steps. There you go. That's why I despise Noam Chomsky, because he's a buffoon. He did something great with his universal grammar. He should have stuck to that. But then when you become the proverbial to every, and I, I have these quotes in the book, you know, I'm paraphrasing now, to, uh, to, to the one who's holding the, the hammer, the world looks like it's made of nails. That's exactly what Norm Chomsky's been doing for 40 years. Every single thing is associated to the U.S. He, you know, he's never met a dictator that he hasn't loved. He hasn't. So he he suffers from regrettably a lack of epistemic humility. You mentioned earlier when you went to give a talk and someone asked you about global warming, and you said, "Well, you know, I don't know enough about global." Well, guess what? I'm exactly like you. If you ask me about global warming, so you know what? I I just don't know enough about it. If you ask me about whether the pros and cons of legalization of marijuana, I just don't know enough about it. But if you ask me about things that, in, as I explained in chapter seven, I've already built the normological network of cumulative evidence for it, then I'm coming at you with all of the swagger that my tsunami of evidence allows me to walk with. In other words, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. Noam Chomsky doesn't know what he doesn't know. He knows about everything. And it's always due to the US military industrial complex and the rest of his bullshit. So that's why I have an aversion to him because he doesn't exude for me the type of, in other words, I could be completely wrong, but I have a sense when I see someone, whether they are somebody that I would like to hang out with, whether they're cool, and he doesn't strike me like he's that guy, because he's the type of guy who's going to be pontificating over me all evening, and I don't like these kinds of fellows. When you uh, think about establishing uh, uh, a, your dream utopian university, sad university, I want to ask you, uh, first of all, what courses would you make mandatory for purely intellectual uh, uh, broadening of the human mind, of a young person's mind? What would you make on the core curriculum of sad university? Well, a great question. Uh, probably how to think. Right? And so maybe I can go to, to that section in the book in answering your question. So in, in chapter seven, uh, it's I discuss how to seek truth. And I argue that you, you, one of the most powerful tools that I can think of epistemologically in establishing the veracity of a position is to build what I call nomological networks of cumulative evidence. And so let me draw a parallel with the original granddaddy of such a process. So Charles Darwin, you know, that white supremacist. Uh, Charles Darwin had, in, in developing his theory of, uh, you know, his ev theory of evolution, natural selection, he didn't collect data from 30 undergrads in Ohio State University and then say, good night, everybody, I've proven my theory. Over almost three decades, he assiduously collected data from an extraordinarily different distinct lines of evidence from geology, from paleontology, from ecology, from biodiversity, from animal husbandry, from comparative morphology, which when you put it all together, it, it, it completed the puzzle, right? And so put that now in a modern context, I argue that what Charles Darwin did 150 years ago is how we need to address questions about the veracity of a position. And let me draw an example, uh, which I discuss in the book. So if I'm trying to convince you, Brian, that toy preferences are not socially constructed. In other words, it's not mommy and daddy who are sexist pigs who tell little Johnny to play with the blue truck and little Linda to play with the pink doll. It's not about that. There are some biological reasons why there is a sex specificity of toys. What are the types of distinct lines of evidence I can get in proving my point to you? So it's, this is not a literature review. Literature review is actually a lot more restrained in its epistemological power. It's not a meta-analysis, it's much bigger than that. It is saying, 
what is all of the possible universal data from every imaginable source across time periods, across cultures, across disciplines, across frameworks that would prove my position. So I won't build you the whole nomological network, but I'll give you a few so that you can get a sense. Well, I could take children who are in the pre-socialization stage of their cognitive de development, meaning that they, they, they're they too young to have been socialized, and I can show you that they already exhibit that sex specificity of toy preferences. That's already putting a, a death blow to the social construct. Yeah, lower well. limit on it, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. but I'm gonna keep going. I could go to comparative psychology and look at other animals, as I mentioned earlier, vervet monkeys, rhesus monkeys, and chimpanzees, and show you that their infants exhibit that sex specificity. Well, now I've shown you from developmental psychology, from comparative psychology, but I'm not done yet. I could get you data from pediatric endocrinology. What does that mean? So little girls who suffer from congenital adrenal hyperplasia, this is a endocrinological disorder that masculinizes the behavior and morphology of little girls. I could take these little girls and show you that if they suffer from this disorder, their toy preferences are reversed. They become like those of boys. I could look at data from several thousand years ago, funerary monuments from ancient Greece, where they have depictions of boys and girls, and I could show you that they depict them playing with the same types of toys that we're playing with today. So bit by bit, through history, through time periods, through culture, I could dismantle the possibility of your position. So what I would do to answer your original question is before teaching people content, what is the capital of France, I would teach them how to think. Because then that, uni that universal epistemological key, I could use it in any landscape you want me to use it. Would you uh, teach Chomsky? Would you teach Zinn? What, what, how would you, even as a cautionary example? Yeah, I mean, it's for the same reason, by the way, that I would teach religion. So even though I'm not, I might not be a very religious person, there are, as a historical document, as a literary document, as a moral document, and at times immoral document, a lot of people think that oftentimes when I critique some of the idea pathogens that come out of the humanities and the social sciences, I'm denigrating those. Uh, not at all. Uh, you can study uh, Chaucer and Shakespeare in a very serious way. You could study uh, the philosophy of aesthetics in a very beautiful, and so it's not as though, oh, you're a physicist, or you're a real thinker, or you're a sociologist, you must have failed in physics class. <laughs> not at all. I don't have a natural no. hierarchy. But what I'm saying though is, always be committed to reason, to logic. Not necessarily always the scientific method, because you can't necessarily study Chaucer using the scientific method, but you can't be decoupled from our reasoning faculties. That's all I'm saying.